All right. Well, thank you very much. This is a, a very different topic. This is uh, one of the newer technologies. And for those of you who have not been exposed to it, um, the shot should be a nice little introduction about uh, the capabilities of, of doing nano arthroscopy. Um, and it also sort of ties in how I use this in my practice. And there is my name in flames. Okay. So disclosures. <laughs> uh, I, I am a paid Arthrex consultant. Uh, and I do not work for Kaiser. Um, practice makes perfect. This is me in the early stages of doing knee arthroscopy. And if you're wondering if that is a cadaveric knee on my porch in the front of my house, the answer is yes, that's true. And so when I was doing this early on, um, I did it sort of in the wrong order. I started uh, on this one cadaver and then I sort of jumped into doing it on patients with the thought that as a you know, knee arthroscopist and someone who had you know, a lot of comfort in doing simple knee arthroscopies, I thought that that experience and skill set would translate directly over doing nano arthroscopy, and that's not the case. So I would just encourage everyone, if they have an interest in this type of thing, to um, just sort of accept that this is, it looks similar, but acts a little bit differently, and we can get into that. And I will will say that a lot of mine has been done in the procedure room with the patient awake, and so that's a whole different uh, type of experience operating on people who are awake and talking, and we're going to get into that as well. Uh, introduction. So I, again, I work in an academic inner city hospital. Every once in a while, I'll nail a femur and we'll get an x-ray and find a little extra metal that we didn't stick in the knee. Um, and I do a lot of different stuff, and a lot of these things sort of combine in my practice, and it keeps it kind of fun. Um, when I was, a, a lot of people sort of wonder, you know, what, is, what are the costs of this type of stuff? And I will say that in my practice, was rather, you know, unsupportive, narrow-minded admin people. So I really had to to do a lot of education, sort of explaining the pros of this and sort of cost analysis. And and once you sort of wrap it up and present it nicely, that it's very easy to convince uh, people to adopt and incorporate these type of technologies in your practice. And I've done over 100 of these, uh, most of them in the procedure room. Uh, more and more in the operating room. And again, we'll talk about why, you know, what are the pros and cons of, of doing them in, in different settings. Um, and that's what it looks like. All right, so what they'll say. So when I started doing this, you know, I have all these, you know, angry, you know, older partners who are saying it's just diagnostic. Um, it's not going to be tolerated. <laughs> uh, you're, just, you're doing procedures, you know, just to get more money. And you, you're going to have to, you know, weather the storm here. Um, and again, I, I think you'll be able to really build a good argument as to why this type of novel technology um, provides you some insight that, you know, maybe prior you didn't think about or, or didn't really know to. And, and so this is an evolution, okay? And where once there was open op, open surgeries, um, you know, and then people use those early arthroscopy equipment where you were literally looking through the barrel of the scope to normal arthroscopy. Um, now, now we are in, in 2020, we are doing nano arthroscopy and it's, it's pretty cool stuff. And these, I did my best to sort of make these pictures um, size accurate. The nanoscope is about one third the size of a fluoroscope when you look at the diameter of everything. And so it's really small. Um, the actual scope is 1.9 millimeters. It's flexible, which is advantageous. Uh, because you can kind of move it around and push around and, and, and the degree of flexibility works, you know, very good um, in in the shoulder and in, in the elbow and the knee. It's not so wimpy that it bends in half, but it's enough so that you can sort of look around corners. And it's also a zero degree scope, which is different. Um, you know, we're all used to looking at 30s and sometimes 70s if you're like Dr. Shore and poking around in hips. Um, the, in the the zero degree is actually very easy to get used to. What What is very different is where you stick the scope um, and, and where you stick the camera and where you stick your instrumentation. Because what is different is that the, the fat pad behind the patellar tendon can cause a lot of problems. And that's one of the challenges I had early on where I thought I'd just stick this nanoscope in the exact same portals. You can't really do that. So normally when I'm scoping a medial compartment, I'm sticking both the scope and the instrumentation in, in the exact same place. And I have a picture of that. And um, there are really two companies right now who produce um, scopes. The nano scope is a proprietary term used by Arthrex. Actually, the majority of the ones I did was before the nano scope was released, and that was uh, by a company named Trice that has the the My Eye 2, which I've used. And they're rather um, similar, and there, I mean, there are some differences. The nano arthroscopy stuff that Arthrex has better resolution, 
is medical grade, so you can actually use it in the operating room where the other one you can't. Um, and ac actually has instrumentation, so you can do biopsies, um, meniscectomies, um, and all sorts of fun stuff. So indications, so I want to thank Dr. Mike Hall for uh, inviting me to do this practice, and this is him at home right now doing some orthopedic telemedicine. Uh, these are my indications for surgery, uh, excuse me, indications for the, using the nanoscope. So this whole list, and we're going to go through them uh, one by one. So MRI alternative, right? There are people that can't get in this scanner. Um, there's not a picture here of someone who is claustrophobic and you know, you'll see that patient that has 20 allergies and is claustrophobic, and you know they're not going to get in the scanner. And so sometimes you're a little bit limited. Maybe you're going to do a CT arthrogram, but, you know, how much does that really show? Uh, people with pacemakers, yes, those people can get into certain MRIs, but at least in the D.C. metropolitan area, there's only one scanner that can accommodate um, pacemakers, and it takes about two months to get on that waiting list, and it's in Baltimore. Um, there's certain spinal stimulators, which are not MRI compatible. And then where, where I'm at, um, you know, at a level one trauma center, you know, my trauma partners will fix plateau fractures and, you know, they'll still have pain six months later and they'll send them to me. And when they have a lot of metal on their knee, the utility of getting an MRI, even with a metal uh, reduction artifact sequence, isn't, isn't so useful. So in some of these situations, um, it can be an alternative to an MRI, although, um, you know, oftentimes it complements MRI. So for me, it also helps with surgery prediction. And here are a couple, you know, real videos that I've taken of, um, of uh, this in-office arthroscopy, and all these patients are awake talking to me. Um, and it really begs the question, what is arthritis, right? We all know arthritis is cartilage loss, but at least in the knee, there are three compartments, and in each compartment, there are two sides of that joint. And yes, you can have people with tri-compartment arthritis with cartilage degeneration or destruction on both sides, but a lot of people have a little bit here, a little bit there, you know, where is it, how bad is it? And um, it, as great as MRI is, we all know that it's, it's not as good as actually looking at the cartilage. And in some situations, it really can underestimate the magnitude or the distribution of the cartilage injury. And in, in my surgical practice, where I do a lot of sports medicine, and I also do a lot of partial and total knee replacements, as I'm assessing people for a true you know, arthroscopy, high tibial osteotomy, bioplasties, partial knees, I'm someone who believes in kinematic total knees and even, you know, standard mechanically aligned total knee replacements. Sometimes having a little extra information beyond MRI, beyond clinical exam, beyond x-rays is very useful. Um, in my former practice, prior to incorporating this uh, more routinely, I would sort of prepare people for one of two surgeries. I would say, hey, listen, you're a tweener. We can scope you and then I'll have a partial and a full you know, re ready to go, and you're going to wake up with one of them. And although people were accepting of that because they didn't have a choice, they feel more comfortable and more educated, by the way, of, of sort of seeing what they have and, and coming to grips with um, whatever particular reconstructive or sporty type of surgery um, that I think is appropriate. Um, you know, you can you can look at, um, oops, sorry, you can look at pathology quite well. well. Why does that matter? I mean, you can look at cartilage, you can look at meniscus, you can look at ACL. I mean, does that really matter if you're going to do a, a true scope? Well, I would submit to you that it does, and this is just a meniscal tear. Um, you know, when it comes to cartilage, size matters, right? If you have a small cartilage lesion, um, you know, if you're someone who believes in microfracture, I suppose you could do that. You know, there's certainly a lot of, uh, of uh, art, uh, cartilage uh, restoration procedures. In my practice, I'm more of a plugs type of guy, but you know, with a small lesion, you can move around cartilage or osteochondral segments from the knee. And as they get bigger, um, you need to borrow cartilage from fresh cadavers, whether that be a circular or, you know, bio uni, which is a proprietary sort of elliptical graft. And I will say that uh, the more I look at MRIs and then compare and contrast to how they actually look, I've noticed some pretty significant discrepancies. Um, again, you don't want to show up to uh, you know, a potential oats and realize you need something bigger. And in some situations, even worse, you don't want to show up thinking that you need some big piece of fresh, you know, cartilage that costs seven thousand dollars just to realize that you needed something much smaller. So in this situation, I find that it's very useful to predict, you know, the type of um, biologic that you're going to use. Um, what about meniscus? This is someone who, by MRI, was already had a meniscal transplant. Um, and so the question was, how much of that meniscal transplant is less, left? And I, you know, acknowledge there that that meniscus is looking a little bit ratty. 
Um, but I would also submit to you that we're not often doing scopes after meniscal transplants. And in this situation, um, I ended up just doing a, a partial meniscectomy of, of the, the meniscal transplant with a osteotomy. This guy had a little bit of some cartilage wear there and he did quite well. Um, what about research? I mean, I don't use this routinely. This is um, someone who I did a nano for other reasons, but this is someone who I did an ACL repair on. And I just thought it was kind of cool that you could see the vascularity of that normal ACL um, now well integrated two years later after an actual repair. And so I think that there probably is a, a, some element of use here if you want to look at stuff. I mean, certainly the gold standard papers, which aren't often done just for ethical reasons, are going back into a knee with a surgery and looking at that meniscal repair, looking at that osteochondral allograft, looking at that cartiform. Uh, but that's a big, uh, you know, big um, hurdle for the patient to accept to get general anesthesia. Now you can just stick it in there and check it out if, if that's sort of what you're looking to do. Injection, in, in my practice, uh, injection isn't huge. I don't do a lot of biologic PRP stem cell, but you certainly could. And, you know, this would give you the ability to really put the medicine in exactly the location intraarticularly where you want it. And what about general knowledge? I mean, I call this a social surgery. Um, you know, the, again, I have people who don't understand what I'm talking about, right? We always talk about the language of medicine, and how complicated it is. And even with my educated, sophisticated patients, which is not all of my people, it can be very difficult to understand. And so, you know, I've had more and more people who are just simply interested in sort of understanding that pathology. And you, and someone could say, well, that's, you know, ridiculous, uh, poorly indicated surgery. But I've got to say that when my patients are educated, whether uh, it's educated for the, the initiation of a conservative management or op operative management, they just do much, much better. Um, and this isn't something I do all the time, but it does allow me to interact with the patient. I literally point things out on the screen and you know they can see a meniscal tear, they can see an osteochondral defect, they can see normal cartilage, they can see arthritis, and it really helps them with expectations and understanding what's going on. So let's get to the fun part, which is all the interventional stuff you can do. And this is uh, a list that I've created. Um, you know, we can augment and add additional visualization, concurrent pathology, long-term expectations. We can confirm what we think is going on. And we can avoid complications. I like this little meme that got sent to me. Um, hopefully no one watching this is uh, doing any intubating. So what about, you know, rotator cuff? And again, I, I get to play around with this stuff and I'm not suggesting that this needs to be done for every surgery. You know, Arthrex at least makes a little cannula that allows you to uh, both scope and um, instrument at the same time, which is kind of cool. And this is me scoping the, the shoulder and lateral, and this is just what it looks like. So the picture on the left is a standard posterior lateral, um, you know, portal with the camera there. But then the picture on the right and what you can see that metallic thing in the left picture is actually the nanoscope. And so, you know, certainly in this type of rotator cuff, it's not necessary, but, you know, I, I suspect that um, in certain rotator cuffs and in certain surgeries, having extra visualization can only help. I often think about pasta repairs, and I must admit, I'm, I'm a little bit on the lazier side, and I don't generally stick the camera in the, the shoulder joint after I do a pasta repair, but, you know, maybe you leave this nanoscope in there and confirm what you sort of expect and hope is is occurring when you when you tie the knots in the subacromial space. What about expectations? I mean, there's tons of literature, um, you know, both in fractures and dislocations, looking at concomitant pathology. You know, we know that 80% cartilage lesion in ankle fractures, and a lot of my foot and ankle colleagues will routinely scope the ankle, um, and you know, even for um, AC joint um, separations and sprains, we know that there's you know, somewhat significant concurrent pathology in the shoulder joint. Um, is it reasonable to stick the camera in the ankle and look? I mean, maybe. I mean, this is an ankle fracture I did. And again, I was just able to stick this in in a minimally invasive way, look at the distal tibia, look at the talus, and confirm that nothing is, there's no osteochondral injury in, in this situation. And, you know, again, um, as I inherit a lot of uh, articular pain coming from my my trauma colleagues, it's nice to know that there is or isn't uh, problems on day one. What about confirming reduction? I mean, this horrible wrist I inherited, um, this was like three and a half months out in, in, a, in a really challenging schizophrenic patient, of course. And, you know, this is the first time I've ever scoped a wrist, by the way. This is not a normal thing that I do. Um, but I just, as I was fixing it, I just stuck it through the volar capsule. And, you know, you look at that x-ray and you wonder, you know, are, are where are those screws? Are they really um, dorsal? Or are they intraarticular? And, you know, not only can you confirm the reduction, which is right there in the middle, but you can also clearly see that there's no metal sticking through 
the cartilage, which begs the question, you know, at some point will we look back and say, you know, how how crazy is it that we were using, you know, C-arms to, to judge reductions? Why not just stick the camera right in? This is not my surgery, but this is a horrible injury in a 27-year-old individual that my my partner did his best, you know, to fix. And, you know, the board answer to most common complication is intraarticular perforation. And so I convinced him just to let me stick this the scope, you know, in the shoulder, you know, granted in the setting of trauma, um, let's see here, there's blood there, which makes all arthroscopy, nanoarthroscopy, otherwise a little bit more challenging. Uh, on the left is the humeral head, on the right is the glenoid. And you can see, um, you know, as I rotate or he rotates the shoulder around, there's no obvious penetration, which, you know, again, um, it gives you some confidence that what you expect and think you haven't done is in fact, you know, what's occurred. Um, what about meniscectomy? Let's get to some, you know, really standard surgeries. So um, left is um, just a, a standard spinal needle looking at at, um, at a pretty simple meniscal tear. On the right is a more complex meniscal tear. These are two different cases. These are all the nanoarthroscopy um, equipment. These patients are, are awake. Um, you can do this in a procedure room. In these situations, I've done these um, with no sedation, just under local anesthetic, um, in in the operating room, in a in a surgery center, which is um, lucrative on the private practice side of things. Um, on the left, in just one second, you're going to see that uh, there's this tiny little biter you can stick in, um, and I'll let that just come up for a second. But um, you know, these tiny little um, instruments fit r right through the cannula. Uh, that exists and they make it, you know, very, very simple. Let me just give this last video a chance to finish so you can see what these little instruments look like. Well, you'll have to take my word on it. It's coming. And so that's what it looks like. I mean, this is that, the, the patient on the left is this. There are three little poke holes. I mean, these people have no pain. I give them zero narcotics. Um, I've reduced my narcotic um, dispension with doing like true interventional uh, arthroscopies by literally 100%. Uh, I give them Tylenol, I give them an antibiotic for a day, they have local anesthetic uh, with a little uh, uh, epi uh, just to help with hemostasis and they do great. So in conclusion, uh, my opinion is that this is a revolution, revolutionizing technology. Um, in certain situations, I think it's gonna replace what we do, but I also think in a lot of situations, it's gonna offer a nice complement. Um, it is possible, and what I'm, you know, hoping to sort of prospectively prove is that, you know, compared to standard arthroscopies, you know, meniscectomies done through nanoscopes are, are they seem to be less painful, and I'm, I wonder whether they're going to have faster recoveries, and that's, you know, really relevant for everyone, um, and professional athletes and workers' comp and all that stuff, and you know, the more we do, the more we do. This is sort of like the wild, wild west of, of knee arthroscopy, so the applications are really expanding. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I was supposed to be on vacation, and instead, last weekend, being at the islands, I had, I'm on quarantine, so I had to uh, celebrate my birthday from 10 feet away from my family, and I hope everyone's doing well and is safe and washing their hands thoroughly. Thanks, Evan. That was a great talk. I, um, you know, I'm, I'm really intrigued about utilizing it uh, intraoperatively to have a, a second point of view, you know, when we're doing normal arthroscopy, but with regard to the, the intra-office uh, use, you know, when you have doing this with, when someone's awake, are you having to put a, a varus of valgus stress on the knee, or is the is the needle small enough that it just kind of sneaks in there? So it depends on the knee. I mean, you can always get into the medial joint without any varus or valgus stress, but uh, as everybody knows, the lateral joint is um, convex. And if you think about how you're doing a normal knee arthroscopy, right, you're putting it into figure four, which is a little bit uncomfortable. Um, in, in someone who is a little bit tighter, I will sort of use my leg in my hand. And if it's really tough, I'll even use assistant to sort of put a little varus on the leg to open it up a little bit. A lot of times you don't need that. And for the lateral compartment, I'll actually put them in the figure four if they can tolerate it and just, you know, stick it directly in. But overwhelmingly, it's much easier to look at, um, medial pathology. It's also rather easy to look at trochlea and patellofemoral stuff. Lateral joint is the hardest, and so as, as people are, are considering this, I would say start medial and then start playing around patellofemoral and then get to lateral after you sort of build some confidence. Again, the fat pad is a real, um, a real humbling anatomic feature, and, um, you know, again, as I, as I said earlier in my talk, 
Uh, my advice is just stay clear of it. So if you want to scope medial, stick the camera medial. If you want to scope lateral, stick it lateral. If you want to go patellofemoral, then the, the fat pad isn't really an anatomic issue. Great. And then, and then how much local are you typically using? Uh, just a couple cc's. Barely anything. Okay. You know, less than five cc's. Great. Well, thank you very much.